Para darmos seguimento à nossa programação, passaremos para a conferência de abertura da 13ª Conferência Lusófona de Ciência Aberta, em que teremos como orador o Dr. Alex Ratchford, do Center for Science and Technology Studies da Leiden University. A conferência tem como tema Research as System and Reforms, Looking Backward and Ahead. Conforme foi referido, a conferência de abertura será exibida em formato de vídeo. No entanto, o orador nos acompanha neste momento de forma síncrona. Para darmos início a esta atividade, gostaria de convidar o doutor Emílio Tostão a ocupar o seu lugar para moderar a sessão da conferência de abertura. Boa tarde a todos. Com a permissão do presídio, passo a apresentar o orador da conferência de abertura que tem como tema Research Assessment Reforms Looking Backwards and Ahead vai ser apresentada pelo Dr. Alex Rashford. O Dr. Alex Rashford é investigador no Center for, for Science and Technology Studies da Universidade de Leiden. É especialista em estudos sociais da ciência, com especial ênfase na avaliação da investigação. Tem interesse de longa data na utilização de indicadores em ambientes de investigação e avaliação. Os seus atuais interesses de investigação centram-se nos desafios do escalonamento e sustentação de novas práticas de avaliação e ambientes de investigação universitária. O Dr. Alex faz parte do projeto Tools to Advance Research Assessment, uma colaboração internacional de investigação aplicada entre o Center for Research and Technology Studies e a Declaração de São Francisco sobre a avaliação da investigação apoiada pelo Fundo Arcadia, que tem como objetivo acelerar reformas de avaliação da investigação. A equipe de projeto utiliza métodos mistos para investigar as reformas de avaliação da investigação na Europa e nos Estados Unidos e co-desenvolver novos instrumentos e recursos para fazer face, para avançar, dizia, estes esforços. É assim que acabei de apresentar o nosso orador convidado para a conferência de abertura. Professor Alex Rashford, I'm sure you can hear us. Professor Rashford, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Então, professor, vai fazer acompanhamento da sua própria palestra, que está gravada, e com apoio técnico, queria pedir, por favor, que passássemos, então, a conferência. Muito obrigado. Hello, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's a real shame I could not be with you in Maputo, but hopefully in the future that will be the case. I will speak today about research assessment reforms looking backwards and looking ahead. And there's a number of important themes and elements that appeared recently, which I'd like to explore in my presentation. Um, I would like to talk first about what I'm calling the long march of research assessment reforms. This is referring to the fact that whilst a number of the challenges and tensions and problems that we face at the moment seem unique to our current age, actually there is quite some historical precedents and there are some patterns if we go back over time in terms of uh, the kind of issues that we, we are sometimes wrestling with, particularly around research evaluation reform, uses of bibliometrics, their relationship to peer review, etc. Um, I will also cover this issue around openness, open research or open science and where that meets research assessment reforms, 
these two reform movements seem to have grown side by side and in, in many ways become increasingly overlapping and interrelated. So I'll try and think about some of the connections there, but also some of the remaining challenges and complexities. And um, I will also uh, leave you with some reflections on the remaining challenges around implementing research assessment reforms in universities and end on a positive note about work that myself and colleagues at my institute CWTS have been doing alongside the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment in a project called TARA. Right, so if we go back to research assessment reform movements, um, these seem to have definitely accelerated to taken off to have taken off in recent times. There's a sense of momentum, purpose, uh, collective vision around them. But at the same time, a lot of the concerns that have been raised by them uh, are nothing new. So we, if we move back to the 1960s, for example, uh, Eugene Garfield, this figure on my left in the coloured photograph, who set up the Science Citation Index, which uh, is nowadays one of the components of the Web of Science uh, database. Um, and it was based on paper back then, as you can see in the middle. Um, so Garfield was setting this up and uh, along, alongside a colleague, Robert Merton, uh, who was involved in early stages of the setup. And uh, Merton saw the potential for research within what later became known as sociology of science, scientometrics, those kind of communities. So looking at publication and citation patterns as a way of studying uh, scientific fields and how they unfold. But also he saw potential for evaluation, for evaluative bibliometrics as it later became known. This idea that uh, citations, publication patterns can be used to look at uh, the performance of individuals, groups, departments, universities, even countries, you name it. And Merton noted a couple of ambivalences towards this. He spoke about goal displacement, for example, this idea that the missions of science, the goals of science might become displaced, might become thwarted or distracted as scientists pursue delivering on particular goals and targets, so hitting the measures of what they require, rather than focusing on core goals or missions. Likewise, task reduction, this sense that uh, scientists might begin to focus on the tasks that yield, um, are likely to yield the greatest recognition and reward, and thereby relegate tasks which don't get recognized in formal systems of reward and recognition. So, for example, we can think about forms of research which are socially important, but which don't uh, come up, they don't score well on a particular assessment regime. Or one can think about uh, activities like teaching, ser professional service and so on, which may become relegated below research. So, of course, things we're not in the 1960s anymore. Many things have changed, but I think it's sometimes interesting, comforting, sobering to note that some of the issues which were later came up around bibliometrics in the last decade or so and which have been campaigned around um, have sometimes been uh, the subjects of complaints many many decades earlier so a lot of the issues around so-called responsible metrics these days are resolved as the field of evaluative bibliometrics themselves but of course things have changed uh, particularly in the 1990s you saw the explosion of various auditing type mechanisms, various measurement systems. Sometimes this comes under the label of new public management. So this is the sense that managerial techniques, governance measures and so on, which are used predominantly or were used predominantly in the private sector can be imported into the public sector in order to bring about improved values as they see it in things like efficiency, accountability, competition. Many eminent social scientists have documented some of these trends. I include a few examples here. There's been talk of the audit society, audit cultures, the evaluation society, and work on the effects of rankings upon universities who kind of internalize their demands 
and uh, often uh, react to them in particular ways about, in order to try and you know climb up the rankings or stay on top. So this can have some kind of reactive effect upon the behavior of those being measured, of course. So these are well-known social science texts, but I would say their effects on the wider world of reform have been not particularly huge and important. I think perhaps more important has been the rise of uh, various individuals in eminent positions who come and speak out about these things and bring attention to them, but also the actual formation of grassroots professional reform movements. So often there's been a wider sense, not just around metrics, but around science going wrong in general. So there's been, of course, in, within the last 10 years, a meta science field has, has been established. There's been this movement around research integrity, the sense that there's a reproducibility crisis within fields like biomedicine, experimental psychology, and so on. So it's trying to bring about uh, what they see as improvements in what's been a decline in scientific practices and scientific conduct over time. Um, and metrics has sometimes been linked to this. It's often been thought of as one of the perverse incentives, which I'll get back to in later slides. Um, one of the figures who is in the bottom right of the screen is actually blocked out on my screen uh, is Frank Miedema. Um, he is the Dean of University Medical Center at Utrecht. He speaks about himself as someone who um, is a sinner, who is recognized the error of his ways and is now preaching a new gospel. And there's a sense really that many of the eminent figures that have come out and spoken out about it, out about it, at least initially, were people who themselves had made careers uh, and done quite well on established research performance measures. Likewise, we see in this Guardian article, uh, Randy Sheckman, a uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist who declared a boycott of top science journals, Nature Cell uh, mm -hmm. Science. So there's a sense really that you have to come from a position of strength sometimes to be a spokesperson speaking out, at least in those early days. So I think these grassroots reform movements, and there's one in the Netherlands called Science in Transition, they've played quite an important role in terms of bringing these issues to wider consciousness. Now that's not to say that they are well known or agreed upon or acted upon everywhere. Some places are more resonant to them than others, but I think there is more of an international conversation than there was 10, 15, 20 years ago about some of these issues. Okay, so back onto bibliometrics. I think a very important intervention uh, over the last 10 years, well, three sets of interventions. One came in 2013, I'm sure you, many of you will have heard of this, the DORA Declaration, the San Francisco Declaration, on research assessment to give it its full title. This, as many of you all know, uh, collected signatures from organizations and individuals pledging not to use journal impact factors in assessing uh, individual researchers or funding applications or other journal-based metrics, not just the impact factor. This has collected many thousands of signatures, but again, if you look at the coverage, not every country has uh attra attracted that many signatures as others uh and it's coming up to its 10-year anniversary now the dora declaration uh so that's dora um and later in 2015 there was the leiden manifesto for research metrics which a number of my colleagues at leiden university were involved in uh this set out 10 global principles for good practice around bibliometric use so the idea is that um, you don't necessarily have to uh, tell people not to use certain metrics, but rather say to them that if you are going to use quantitative indicators to assess, say, candidates or departments or wh whichever, then these are 10 minimum standards you should be meeting. It included uh, values like transparency, so this notion that those being uh, evaluated through quantitative indicators should be able to check that the data is actually correct uh, and feedback into that. There's also general remarks that uh, no single indicator should be used. There should be multiple indicators at any one point, so you shouldn't over rely just on, on one score. And likewise, any indicator should supplement judgment rather than replace it. 
So that's the Leiden Manifesto. And I think one of the reasons it's been quite popular compared to previous discussions and attempts to promote appropriate uses of research metrics from the science and metrics community is A, it was published in Nature, the journal, so it reached a wide audience. B, I think it packaged its 10 standards in quite a neat, memorable way, so it makes them easy to circulate and travel. In earlier ages, scientometricians would have produced big, long monograph textbooks with a lot of technical information, which aspiring evaluators would be expected to learn and read about. So this is something that's a bit more simple, a bit more intuitive to pick up. Then in later that year, 2015, there was the metric tide, which uh, was started out as a report to HEFKE, a uh, governing body in the United Kingdom responsible for their national audits to research excellence framework. The initial brief around 2014 was the sense that policymakers were considering whether the research excellence framework should shift from being peer review based to being one that's predominantly metrics based or entirely metrics based. And the report was commissioned in order to ask, was this a feasible idea? Was it a good idea? Uh, the scope of the report did subsequently expand, though, when various stakeholders got involved, and it began to become a report in, more generally into the effects of metrics upon research system in the UK and belong, uh, beyond. Um, so th it concluded that uh, now is not the time for uh, a metrics-based system. It gave various reasons for this. It came up also with five principles of responsible metrics. So a bit like the Leiden Manifesto produced these global principles of good practice. This was modelled on uh, the policy movement for responsible research and innovation. It includes included features like uh, transparency, robustness and humility. And the metric tide also gave the world the umbrella label of responsible metrics, which the this promotes appropriate uses of metrics has often organized under. So again, a lot of what was covered in some of these interventions was not new per se, but it was packaged in quite an appealing way by certain individuals and parties with a platform of visibility. Um, and it helped to create something, a set of concerns that had often been kind of isolated in silos. Uh, it helped them gain greater prominence and attention. But again, one always has to qualify that it, these messages, these reform movements, framings haven't resonated equally everywhere. And if we fast forward to more recent times, the last couple of years, it seems like we are not only speaking about responsible metrics anymore, so what is appropriate or inappropriate uses of quantitative performance indicators, but we're thinking a bit more generally about what's sometimes called responsible research assessment. So this is asking a broader set of questions. What is evaluation for? What is meant by research quality? Can we think of it in more heterogeneous terms than simply uh, citations, funding, and so forth? Can we think about impact in broader sense as well? So this may include things like, of course, openness, integrity, the broader social societal impacts of research, and so on. There are a number of initiatives which I've included on here, which I think all share some kind of family resemblance. They all commit to responsible use of research metrics. They are wary of very mechanical uses of research metrics, but they also try to imagine a more heterogeneous form of evaluation that occurs in research that can help to build uh, a better science working environment for people in it and a more sustainable science system going forwards. And it's worth saying that this is one slide. I could have filled another slide of images of documents and statements and agreements and so forth, because there really is a flurry of activity that's going on here. So, one of the features, of course, is that it's not just responsible metrics, which has driven this more recent movement around research assessment reform, but there have been other reform movements which coincided with it and which, as they've grown in size across time and space, they've collided with each other, they've noticed various synergies and overlaps, 
and they've started to respond and adjust to each other as well. Open science is clearly one uh, one of these examples. Uh, so this movement um, has started to resonate quite a lot with the research assessment reform movement. Um, one of the reasons why is that uh, the open, a lot of open science reports and statements these days um, accept the framing by those in the responsible metrics movement that in order to get to where you want to go, in order for open science to become mainstream, um, you need research assessment to be reformed because there's a sense that there's the wrong incentives currently in our research systems. So that needs to be changed in order to get to this open science future. Um, this notion of disincentives has become quite prominent and quite influential in a lot of this language. Carlos Mudas here talks about policies to promote open science should include incentives and not just mandates. So it's not just enforcing or coercing individuals and organizations to follow open science practices, but also incentivizing it some, in some ways. Um, this document, uh, which was uh, published by the European Commission in 2017 called Evaluation of Research Careers Fully Acknowledging Open Science Practices, I think it has a key quote here and I'm going to read it out. It says that researchers advance in their career through assessment, and this is the key factor to ensure that open science becomes mainstream. The exclusive use of bibliometric parameters as proxies for excellence in assessment by those funding agencies and universities or research organizations does not, fill us, does not facilitate open science. Researchers' engagement in open science will increase through encouragement and incentives from employers and funders through assessment. So using assessment as an instrument to try and wield changes is what is seen as important here and to change incentive systems. Likewise, we have a source here. This is the Hong Kong principle of uh, for assessing researchers. Um, and this is a research integrity international movement that's set up in the last few years. It says again that we strongly believe that current metrics may act as perverse incentive in the assessment of researchers. The principles outlined in this essay focus specifically on the undermining effect on research integrity of research metrics. So these other movements outside of the responsible metrics movement have taken this message on board that we need to be reforming research assessments. And often there's a sense then that uh, evaluation is an instrument, a tool, or you know, a kind of can opener to try and wield some kind of change in practice to make it mainstream. Um, so like a can opener, evaluation is an instrument, a tool that may wield certain outcomes, but perhaps this analogy is also somewhat limited. If can opener uh, is a simple system, whereas evaluations occur within complex social systems with feedback loops, reflective actors, uh, thousands of individual actions which are interacting with one another. So it doesn't always deliver the kind of simple operations that we may hope for or imagine in thinking about evaluation as an instrument. So we need to unpack this further, surely. Some of the ambig ambiguities that are often raised around these sorts of issues about, well, great open science should be, feature more within evaluation, but how so? One of the features people often remark on is that uh, openness is not really a direct, it's not really about uh, outcomes or impacts in the way that quality sometimes is thought to be. Uh, so Elizabeth Gadd here, in the UK talks about openness kind of replace sightedness. And there's also often claims that um, it should really be a bare minimum for researchers to practice open science. Uh, so it's not something that individuals and researchers should be particularly congratulated upon. It should be the bare minimum. And it's not necessarily something we want to rate and compare candidates or applications against. Another complexity is that the relationship of openness to quality and impact is ambiguous. This is because, of course, notions like quality and impact are themselves ambiguous, but actually so too is the notion of openness. So openness is multifaceted and ambiguous as a concept in itself. It's an umbrella label, so it is multifaceted. And in the context of evaluation, we have to be a bit clearer about what do we mean by introducing openness as a criteria. 
do we mean recognizing and rewarding publishing open access? Does it mean print, uh, providing preprints of one's work? Is it about uh, we include citations to preprints? Is it actually then something different? Is it about uh, scholars' data sharing activities, their open source software activities, perhaps? Maybe even it's publishing open educational resources in the context of teaching. And then if we think about outside of uh, the formal parameters of research assessment, about the wider infrastructure, there's questions about openness around research information. So the metadata on which citations and other publication-based analytics is based is very often proprietary. It's not shareable in a kind of open science logic in data repositories. Uh, and it's often unavailable for institutions without access to major databases. Um, without subscriptions, it's not available to them. So then there are overlaps and convergences also with the research integrity movement here. Um, so there are a number of questions about what we actually mean when we talk about openness here, and it's still an ongoing unfolding uh, conversation. So openness is multifaceted, but openness is also ambiguous in that different actors have different perceptions of what constitutes meaningful or acceptable openness. They can look at the same practice differently and come to quite different conclusions. So the trick, I think, is for incentives not to be spoken of as some kind of magic bullet. Um, we think of it as this alternative to mandating openness that is going to be more attractive and more and it's going to work well. But incentives are complex. It's not always easy to anticipate what the preferences or the actions will be of autonomous reflexive agents, researchers, evaluators, and so on. Uh, they are not driven, contrary to some beliefs, by uh, maximizing self-interest. Uh, there is also uh, norms, cultural scripts, regulations, and routines which play a role. We can also think about the old idea of bounded rationality, this notion that individual agents in organizations do not have perfect knowledge of what it is they're using, what it, the routines that they follow. So they may think that there are certain demands, external demands or pressures for them to behave in a certain way. That might that may be poorly informed, or they may think that there are no such demands, there are no such pressures externally when in fact there are. So this notion that there's imperfect information is something that we always have to bear in mind in terms of our expectations about what will happen when we try and introduce a very rational uh, incentive system or rational instruments into complex systems. One may find intended consequences, but one is also likely to come across unintended consequences. Maybe incentives is the wrong language or not the only language we should be using. We should be thinking about norms of good practice. This can be quite mundane. We might think about the writing and documenting practices that occur, for example, around CVs and applications. There may just be uh, new precedents to try and uh, for example, if one gives a presentation, like I'm doing now, to afterwards deposit this on a file sharing repository, generate a DOI, and put a link in my CV uh, to this presentation so as others can access it afterwards. Uh, so making sharing a bit more readily accessible and usable. Likewise, some institutions have begun to uh, ask candidates to include statements whereby they will commit to research integrity or open science practices. Now, one can think of this perhaps as um, tick boxing insofar as there may be a gun to the head of the applicant. I can't very well ignore this. Um, but this is something that we can also think about um, in terms of a, a kind of nudging type intervention in terms of promoting openness in the context of evaluation. And I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this afterwards, whether some of these interventions are good ideas or not. So, so far, I've definitely presented more questions than answers, complexified rather than simplified things. I think, um, do not despair, though. There are actually examples of some quite interesting initiatives uh, going on at the moment where they are indeed trying to introduce uh, openness as a criteria within research assessment practices in universities. A prominent example is Norway. They were inspired by the European Commission um, and something called Open Science Cam, which was developed 
and trialed initially in uh, 2017, and they developed their own Norwegian version of it. It's a toolbox for recognition and rewards in academic careers. Uh, and Nor Norwegian universities have agreed to implement NORCAM in hiring pr and promotion decisions for their faculty staff. So there are six areas of competence that the assessment matrix covers. Output, process, pedagogical competence, impact and innovation, leadership and other experiences. Um, so there are then different columns about how this might be recognised with respect to open practices. So there's results and competencies. So what have you been your actual outputs or skills learned or relationships that you've developed, your experiences. Then there's another column about documentation, like how can these different um, activities be well documented? And then there's a reflection column, which is about uh, offering chance for reflection, deliberation on the part both of candidates and evaluators. So I think these uh, this is a very interesting natural experiment insofar as it's now being introduced at the present time. So it'll be very useful to track uh, how this develops going forwards and how people like it or don't like it, whether it needs refining and whether it's a sustainable solution going forwards that may be scaled up elsewhere. And I think one of the main interventions that has occurred in recent times uh, came back in July 2022. It's the European Agreement on Research Assessment Reform. Uh, many, many stakeholders and actors have been involved in drawing up this document. And in it, uh, organisations will be able to commit to implementing the values, principles and visions articulated in this document. It's principally aimed at European Union uh, member states, research actors within uh, member states, but actually um, it's open to anyone uh, worldwide to sign and pledge to implement. And I think it'll be very interesting to see going forward to what happens here. Now, I wrote a blog where I outlined some of the challenges ahead uh, for this agreement. So some of the basic features were that, of course, it's not coercive, it's not mandatory, so it's a coalition of the willing. So it may well resonate with certain actors, certain enthusiasts, but whether uh, it can just be ignored by others who are not keen on it or are not sold on its vision or don't have the resources uh, to do it, uh, that will be something that you know may well occur. Um, and likewise, of course, there isn't any centralised, new centralised funding for institutions to take this up. So they're going to have to commit their own resources and finances uh, to these kinds of complex change efforts locally. And of course, this is a microcosm, really, of many of the challenges that the research assessment reform movements internationally face. That, for the most part, it's been based upon trying to gain the buy-in for their message to resonate with certain actors. It's about producing agreements, best practices, concordats, and so forth. There's nothing particularly binding to it. So it'd be interesting to see where these uh, reforms get taken up in future and where they don't. And also, I think one of the things that we're trying to do in uh, Leiden is to try and help contribute to global knowledge about research assessment reforms and uh, to share knowledge and lessons learned from different systems and to help produce online communities of practice about this emerging important topic of interest. And on that note, uh, I will leave you with an example of what we've been doing. Uh, this is a flagship initiative that our institute is doing in collaboration with the DORA Declaration, who I mentioned earlier. Um, so our aim is to produce something called RRA Tracker, which stands for Responsible Research Assessment Tracker. This will be an online dashboard, which will collect, label and organise institutional standards for hiring and promotion to the end, which relate to what we're calling Responsible Research Assessment. So Responsible Research Assessment, the way in which we're going to label and categorise these materials uh, was co-designed in collaboration with the DORA community. They saw a number of different features of this umbrella label 
responsible research assessment. They saw things like responsible metric statements, open science practices, um, evaluation, um, appointment systems which try and reward research integrity, diversity, equity, and inclusion on the part of staff, and so on. So it's again, it's assessment forms of assessment that try and break away from a more classical, traditional, mechanical, bibliometrics and funding-based uh, evaluation systems for appointments. So the idea is to collect internationally lots of uh, new and emerging practices. We're not necessarily saying that every single thing that will be included in this is something we would endorse ourselves, but we're more just bringing it into a collective repository and allowing others to check it. Because, for example, if you would like to go about your own local reform efforts, you may want to consult with similar undertakings that have been uh, that have happened elsewhere, and this will be a useful resource to consult. And one of the things we should say is that uh, if you are interested in, um, if you are not, if you know about any initiative that has that might fit within our criteria, then please do get in touch. We'd be very interested to look at it and perhaps showcase it within the dashboard. So the dashboard will be available around uh, May of 2023. This will coincide with uh, Dora's 10 year anniversary. So keep an eye out for this, please. Uh, and the thing I should mention as well is that if uh, you would like uh, any items to be included in the dashboard, then um, at the moment we can only take English language based uh, documents. So if there is something in Portuguese, for example, uh, on one of your university websites, which you think is in the responsible research assessment uh, umbrella, then if there could be an English translation of this put online, that would be very helpful, because then we would be able to include it. And that's just purely a kind of resource issue, I'm afraid, at the moment, that we can't include things outside of the English language. So this is uh, part of Project Tara. Uh, I'm very excited to see what the results are and very excited also to conclude my presentation now and move on to the question and answer session, which will be not on a video recording, but live in the room. Thank you so much for your attention and my contact details I will leave on here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Rashford, for your clear and uh, um, instructive pre presentation. Um, this is a keynote uh, address. Uh, we are not going to open up a discussion, but as Professor Rashford said, if there's a burning issue, uh, it may be reason. Professor Rashford, I thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, thank you, um, Ricardo. If you want to add something, um, please do before we close. Uh, no, nothing to add. Um, just uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, <clears throat> I, again, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but um, <laughs> please um, <clears throat> enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, do get in touch if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, um, it looks like there's a burning one here. So I will ask you to hang on for... Uh, yeah, Alex, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm I'm Eloy Rodriguez. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for for uh, being able to be with the, uh, with us here today. As we are running late, I just have a very uh, short uh, question. It's it's about the RR tra tracker and the relation with the the, 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 the the initiative of of Europe that you've just mentioned. So the 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 the, the reform the the, the agreement on, on reforming uh, research assessment. As you know. Uh, uh, there is an organization that has been establishing uh, established to 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 advance that that agreement. It's called the Coalition for Advancing Refer uh, Research Assessment, and one of the objectives is to collect best practices and and uh, the real examples of implementation of the commitments. My question is: Is there any uh, uh, already any? Uh, uh, contact or idea to use the R tra tracker also as a tool for the coalition in, in Europe? Oh yeah, um, I think that will be something we do want to align with, yes. Um, so we started the RRA tracker before the European agreement was announced, but we definitely would like to indeed 
begin to fill up? I mean, so far we've we've been able to find some policies ourselves and we've had some workshops where people have been able to deposit examples. But we expect actually this uh, dashboard to expand a lot over the coming years. And indeed, um, if people think that something is missing from the dashboard, if there's a policy that they could have mentioned that we haven't spotted, then we would definitely invite them to, to get in touch with us. Um, at the moment, we're only covering examples of um, faculty professors being hired because we were a small project. So we wanted to start modestly, but in the next year, we are going to think about how we can expand the remit, the scope of the dashboard and what kind of documents it includes. And they imagine quite some of these movements, including the European one, will, will help us to fill up uh, the dashboard going forwards. Thank you. Thank you. Muito obrigado, professor Eloy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor um, Rashforth, uh, for this um, answer, and but uh, above all, for your notes, that was very well received. Thank you so much, Professor Thank Rashford. Thank you. Obrigado. Boa tarde. Have a good day. Boa tarde. Muito obrigado a todos. Um, acho que a questão que levantava a professora Eloy tem a ver com Eloy tem a ver com o uso da da ferramenta Air Tracker. A professora Eloy queria saber se já está já há algum contato para ser usado na avaliação na Europa ao que foi respondido que sim já há um contato inicial está a explorar essa possibilidade foi o que nós percebemos uh, muito obrigado uh, professor Rashford falou da avaliação responsável da investigação um, indicou que há várias métricas e nenhuma deve ser usada em, de forma isolada uh, e que essa uh, avaliação, portanto, deve ser usada de, com indicadores múltiplos. Uh, nós achamos que isto era muito importante um, porque a UEM está, nesta altura, empenhada na sua transformação em velocidade de investigação. Então, estes são realmente fatores a ter em conta. A questão é como é que a ciência aberta contribui para a qualidade impactos, perguntava o orador, e dizia que a ciência aberta não é, não é uma vara mágica, uh, mas, uh, portanto, pode ser bastante útil. Falou do experimento na Noruega e agora, mais para o fim, uh, de, todo, de toda a mudança na Europa. Muito obrigado pela oportunidade que nos foi concedida para moderar esta sessão. Uh, devolvo a palavra ao mestre Simone. Muito obrigado.